All right, good evening once again. Good to see you all here. Uh, we are going through the Old Testament, much like we're going through the New Testament on Sunday mornings, um, here, on this, here on Sunday evenings, and we're going through the book of Genesis, and we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. And Genesis chapter 5 is one of those chapters that if you're reading through uh, the Bible, doing your daily reading or whatever the case may be, chapter 5 might be the one that you might just read through real quickly. It might be one that you kind of just skip over. Um, it's basically just a genealogical record uh, for the most part of, of different names of people as they had children and it goes on down from there. But if we really stop and pause and reflect on this chapter and give it uh, the attention it deserves, we find that there are some great profound truths contained in Genesis chapter 5. And, and so much so, we probably will spend uh, at least two Sundays on chapter 5 because we really want to unearth all the precious treasures that are contained within this chapter. And for now, we're just going to be dealing with verses 1 through 3. And that may be all that we get to this afternoon. Uh, and we're going to find uh, some very important, or at least one specific, really important uh, idea in these verses. Uh, but we'll deal with that in a moment. For now, let's just read the verses. This is Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. It says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made them in the likeness, made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. All right, so this starts off with, this is the book of the generations of Adam. And that phrase, uh, the book of the generations of, is a phrase that you find time and time again throughout the book of Genesis. Matter of fact, uh, some scholars would actually outline the book of Genesis by that phrase and, and sectioning it off by that particular statement. Uh, we saw this back in Genesis chapter 2 in verse 4, where in the original language it's the same exact phrase. And the King James Version actually uh, translates it the same as generations. But there it says, this is the account of the heavens uh, and the earth when they were created. And so the... the the New American Standard translators are kind of helping us out, saying that this phrase can be used in different ways. Here, with the generations of Adam, the book of the generations of Adam, is, they probably translate it generations because it's about to get into a genealogical line, you know, different generations that came from Adam. But the word originally just means uh, this is what became of, or, or this is what uh, happened uh, after, or in connection with this particular individual or this particular thing. And uh, so that's what we're going to find. What came of Adam's race? Uh, we'll see here a real quick summary of the creation of Adam and some important details about it. But it doesn't just stop there. It's going to go on and say, you know, what happened with Adam? What happened with his descendants is basically the way we could look at that. It says, uh, continuing on in verse 1, it says, In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Uh, in verse 2, he created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them uh, man in the day when they were created. Now, that's just a real quick summary of what we read in chapter 1, in, uh, starting in verse 26, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And he goes on from there. Again, a, a little bit more detail than what we find in Genesis chapter 5, verses 2, uh, the beginning or the end of verse 1, going on into verse 2. Basically, they're made in the image of God, and then God blessed them. Uh, and just give him more detail of how they were blessed. Where the expansion takes place in chapter 5 is that we don't, we just, instead of just hearing a command, uh, multiply and fill the earth, we actually see this actually taking place in chapter 5 as it goes through this uh, genealogical line. Um, if you want to contrast chapter 5 with chapter 4, you can see chapter 4 as a worldly genealogy, 
And chapter 5 has a spiritual genealogy. And what I mean by that is in chapter 4, we had the genealogy of Cain and his descendants. And a lot of focus is on uh, some worldly achievements that they had, some earthly achievements that they had. There's, uh, they began to build cities. They uh, began to get... Uh, they began to uh, create occupations for themselves, uh, also entertainment with the different musical instruments. Uh, they began to acquire some technology with the, be able to implement various metals and, and put those into practice. And so you see kind of a worldly thing. This is the, the human accomplishments according to uh, their earthly existence. Whereas in chapter five, the focus on the genealogy is on the spiritual. We could really back it up to chapter four with Enosh, where it talks about there, that's when they begin to call upon the name of the Lord. We also see later on uh, Enoch, who comes onto the stage, who walked with the Lord and was caught up uh, because he had uh, lived a life of uh, faithfulness to God. Uh, we're going to see Methuselah. We're going to see also Noah come from this line. And so a lot of spiritual heritage found in Genesis chapter 5. But as it continues on in, in verse 3, Oh, wait, before we go there, let's talk about this image. Uh, here we, say, we see that uh, he made man in the likeness of God, which again corresponds to what we found in chapter 1 and verse 26, where it said, in the likeness and the image of God. And there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of writing about what is the image of God? What does that mean precisely? Um, some suggestions have been in the fact that we have a spirit. Remember in, in uh, John chapter 4, we find that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And maybe because God has put within us a spirit that we are made in his image. Maybe it's because of our intellectual capacities, our ability to uh, have logic, to be able to think things through, the emotions that we have, the connections that we have. Maybe it's something intellectual that makes us like God. Whatever this image of God is that he has placed within us, it, it, distinguishes, it distinguishes us from the rest of creation and the rest of the animals. Uh, there's something special about mankind. And that's why we treat one another a lot different than perhaps we would treat an animal or a plant or something like that. Um, in Genesis chapter 9, when we get to the story of Noah, this image of God is mentioned again, and it's in connection to murder saying you, you should not shed man's blood because man is made in the image of God. And so there's something special about man being made in the image of God. There's the, what we would call the sanctity of life in connection to this image bearing that we have. And so God created male and female, blessed them, put, uh, created them in his image. And so you have Adam and Eve. And then when Adam is 130 years old, we're told in chapter 5 and verse 3, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. So Adam was 130 years old. In all likelihood, the best that we can guess is that when Adam was created from the dust of the ground, he was probably created as an adult male. Uh, it seems to read that way. The language seems to indicate that as soon as he was created, all of a sudden he could name the animals. He seems to be able to relate with God. He's already given instructions of what to do and tending to the garden. Uh, giving the commandment not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But this is 130 years from that point on, which indicates that there was probably a lot of other people that uh, were already born in connection to Adam and Eve. Um, there's, a, there's a good chance that uh, Cain, Abel, and Seth aren't the only descendants of Adam and Eve. For one, you know, who would they marry if it was just three sons? Um, there was already a community of people Cain's concerned about uh, being mistreated because of the fact that he killed Abel. Uh, he's able to build a city uh, with his son. Uh, and so there's indication that there are already people around. So the creation account, or this genealogical account, is really focusing on certain individuals. It's not excluding or saying that nobody else was born. It's just that the Bible isn't interested in telling us everybody that's born. Uh, we'd have to have the Bible in a U-Haul truck or something like that if we wanted to have an account of everybody that was born. There's specific people mentioned, and we'll probably talk about that more next week as we get further into this genealogy. But nonetheless, he's 130 years old, and he becomes the father of this son in his own likeness, and he named him Seth. 
Now, what does it mean now that it says that Adam became the father of a son in his own likeness according to his image? If you look in the original language in the Hebrew, the same word for likeness, the same word for image, those are the same two words that are found in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So you have in Genesis 1.26, man being created in God's image and likeness. But in chapter 5 and verse 3, you have Seth being born in the image and the likeness of Adam. So there's two different approaches you can take with this. And I think in both cases, you come away with the right idea. Neither one of these really leads you into any type of error or anything like that. The first line of thinking you can take is to say, okay, Adam was made in the image and the likeness of God. And then he had a son, Seth, who was made in his image and likeness. And therefore, the, the image of God is passed down generationally. That Adam is made in the likeness and image of God has passed down to Seth. And we could say thousands upon thousands of generations or however many generations there's been, uh, that same image has been passed down. And that's definitely true. Uh, who can argue with that? Each little child that's born, even while they're still in the womb, uh, they still bear the image of God. There's something special about human life. Human life is to be held in honor and respect, and that has continued on throughout all generations. So that's a, definitely a correct uh, observation and is, could be a very accurate interpretation of that phrase. But there's another way to look at it as well. You could see it as not completely contrasted with, but at least held up in tension with the image of God and the image of Adam. In other words, Adam was made in the likeness and the image of God, but then he had a son named Seth who would have still been born in the image of God, but at the same time was born in the image and likeness of Adam. That there was something passed down from Adam onto Seth that we could call his likeness or his image. And... That's the, that's the line of thought we want to chase down this afternoon and see if this really follows through with uh, New Testament teaching, particularly as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it might be helpful because we're going to see the image of Adam mentioned once again, but here from a New Testament perspective. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the context is there is this big controversy within the Corinthian church that you know, well, is there actually going to be a resurrection? If there is a resurrection, what's it going to look like? What type of bodies will we have? Uh, there's just a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, division over this idea of the resurrection. So Paul spends a very lengthy chapter. Uh, of course, they were in chapters back then, but he spends a, lot, a lengthy part of his letter addressing the resurrection. And that's where we're kind of just jumping in in the middle of in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because we want to focus on verse 42 uh, on down, because it, it applies very closely to what we are discussing in Genesis chapter 5. It says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It, that's talking about the body, it is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is also raised, or it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So here, the Apostle Paul is showing the distinction between the natural body, as we have them today, and then what the body will be like once it's resurrected. And there's a big contrast between the two. Our bodies, as they're sown, and the idea of being sown is basically being put in a tomb, being put into the earth, like a seed is placed into the earth. But uh, it is sown as a perishable body. And definitely we see that at funerals. Definitely we see how the human body is perishable. Um, it definitely is alive for a, however long it might be. It, it, it's healthy, perhaps, for an extended period of time. But eventually, we perish. Eventually, we deteriorate. Eventually, our bodies... Uh, began to become corrupt and they end up dying and passing away. He says it's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. Our physical bodies are weak uh, in a lot of ways. 
It, it, but then he says in verse 44, it's sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. And so here we have the natural body uh, connected to the natural world around us, where we know that everything around us is corruptible. Everything around us will deteriorate and go away. Uh, you could think about a car. You buy a brand new car, and maybe it's a 20, 23, 20, 24 model, and it's got all the bells and whistles. It's got the new car smell, brand new tires, uh, it's shiny, the engine purrs perfectly. Everything's great about it. But if you visit that same car in 10 years, it's not going to look that way at all. Or, or if it does look like that way, it's going to take a lot of elbow grease and a lot of time and, and uh, money to help it maintain that way. We just live in a corruptible world. And in the natural realm, things decay. Things go out. Things play out. And we spend a lot of energy just trying to keep our houses uh, together. We spend a lot of time just trying to keep everything together, but it all wants to go back into chaos. It all wants to go back into corruption, and it all ends up fading away. And that's the type of bodies that we have, is what Paul's saying. He says in verse 45 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, So also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So the first man, Adam, became a living soul. He was a person who was brought up from the dust of the ground, as we read in chapter 2 of Genesis. God breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So he was in a passive state where he was created, and then he had to receive life from God to become a living soul. In contrast to that, the last Adam, which is referring to Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Not one that had to receive life from someone else, but one that actually dispenses life to others. He becomes a life-giving spirit. So you can see now the Apostle Paul bringing us into two lines of thoughts, or two different um, realities. One in accordance to the first man, Adam, who was a living soul, but will play out, um, will die. He's in a perishable body. But the last Adam being that resurrected Christ, the ascended Christ, who can actually dispense life, not only has eternal life in himself, but is also able to dispense that to others. In verse 46, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. Now, the first man is from earth, earthy, the second man is from heaven. So we haven't experienced the spiritual bodies, the resurrected bodies, the ones that are imperishable, the ones that are full of glory, full of power, that are spiritual, we haven't experienced that first. What did we experience first? We experienced the natural body. And we've all experienced the natural body. We all know what it feels like to, you know, to go through the whole process of always having death pending, always having death lurking around in the shadows, knowing that no matter how young we are, eventually we're going to get old, eventually we're going to wear out, eventually we're going to die, whether it's because of sickness, illness, injury, or disease, our bodies are weak and they're not made to last forever. And that's what we have experienced first. We've experienced the natural, uh, the natural body, or we could say the earthy body, he also calls it here. So he says the, in verse 47, the first man is from the earth, earthy. Who is the first man that he's referring to? Well, you have to go back to verse 45, which says the first man, Adam, became a living soul. So he's referring to Adam, he calls Adam earthy, and the earthy is, is uh, tied to the natural. So Adam is natural, he's earthy, which ties in all these negative things that are in connection to the earthly body. But he says the second man is from heaven, referring to Christ, the last Adam. And so Christ put on this perishable body for a certain amount of time. He, he taught in Judea, in that whole area over there. He performed miracles, you all know the story, but he eventually died on the cross. But then he was resurrected into life. And not only resurrected into life, he ascended to the right hand of the Father in glory and power and all of those things. And so he's referred to here as the heavenly. So he says, as is the earthy, so also are, are the earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. So he's already beginning to clue us in on where we're going here. 
Um, there's a tie between what we are now and tied to Adam and what we, will, what we will be as we're tied to Christ. In verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So there's the key verse there that kind of ties us back to Genesis chapter 5. It could very well be the case that when it talks about Seth being born in the image of Adam and according to his likeness, it could be tied to this idea of the fact that he received a natural body, a perishable body, a corruptible body, a body that will die, a body basically that is cursed. It goes back to the curse of Adam. We said from dust you came to dust you shall return. And so that's the bad news. We all have to experience that. We have to experience sickness and illness. We have to watch our loved ones get sick. We have to watch our loved ones die. Uh, we ourselves can feel the aches and pains of age. Uh, we can experience just how difficult and hard it is to live in the physical realm. But we have the hope that just as we have borne the image of the earthy, just as we have received the image of Adam in our, in our being, in our, in our bodies, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. What this tells us is that it's just as sure, just as sure as you're in a natural, physical body, as sure as that is, just as sure as you have a body just like Adam had, that's how sure it is that you're going to have a body like Christ, a heavenly body. It's just as sure. Now, does anyone here doubt that you have a physical body, that you have a perishable body, a corruptible body, I think everybody here and everybody watching online can realize, yes, I'm in a physical body. Well, just as sure as you're in a physical body, through our connection with Christ, through faith in Christ, we can be just as sure that one day we will bear the image of Christ, the, the image of the heavenly. Now, this isn't the only passage that talks about this. We could go to Philippians chapter 3, the very last verse of Philippians chapter 3, that supports this very idea. Actually, we'll start in verse 20, just to get the whole sentence there. Philippians 3, starting in verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state, okay, the natural body, the earthy body, the perishable body, will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory, the heavenly body that Christ has by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. That word transform in the original is the word that we get metamorphosis from. Like a caterpillar uh, metamorphosizes, if that's the right word, into a butterfly. That's what will happen with our bodies. They're, they're sewn into the ground, but then, they, and then but they, they go through this transformation in which they turn into these powerful, glorious, imperishable, incorruptible bodies. But they're in the image of and in the likeness of Christ's own resurrected body. If we need further support, we could go to 1 John chapter 3 as well. We actually looked at these verses this morning in connection to the Lord's Supper. But in verse 2 of 1 John chapter 3, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see him just as he is. Doesn't use quite as strong language as Philippians 3, but it seems to fall in line with what Philippians chapter 3 was telling us. That we don't know yet exactly what our bodies will be like. If also Paul gave us some ideas, he gave us some um, pointers as to you know, what we might expect. We don't know exactly though yet what our bodies will be like, but we do know that when he appears, we will be like him. However that might be, we won't be divine we won't you know have all the divine attributes that christ have but in some way in some in some essence we're going to be like christ probably in respect to the idea that he's in the powerful glorified eternal never to be destroyed body and we will be as well and in that sense we will be like him and, and we will also be able to see him as he is so we will bear the image of the heavenly in that regard Okay, so this is all fine and good. This gives us encouragement for tomorrow. It gives us encouragement when our loved ones pass away. It gives us encouragement in our day-to-day -day walk. But what does this mean for us practically? Is this just some theological 
uh, study that we just kind of think about and we say, yeah, but this is all something far in the distance, things we shouldn't even concern ourselves about today? Well, absolutely not. When we reflect on the fact that just as we bore the image of the earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly, it has some practical effects in our lives, or it should have some practical effects in our lives. And we find this even in 1 John 3, where we're at right now. In 1 John 3, in verse 3, he follows up what he just said with this. And he says, And everyone who has, who has this hope, fixed on him, purifies himself, just as he is pure. So here the idea is that with this great hope that we have, this great expectation that one day we will be able to experience a body in, in similitude to the body that Christ possesses, this eternal body, this heavenly body, in anticipation of that, today, this very day, and, and tomorrow and the next day, however long we have to live, our greatest concern then should be that we want to purify ourselves as he is pure. In other words, if we're going to be like him in a bodily sense, we also, uh, in the future, we should be like him in a moral sense today. We should begin even today to purify ourselves, to so go ahead and begin to emulate him and express him in our, in our, moral, uh, in our moral lives. In, uh, Romans, in Romans chapter 8, we see that uh, not only will we be transformed, not only will we be metamorphosized, or however you want to say it, uh, all of creation will be as well. In Romans chapter 8, uh, we see that, uh, we'll start in verse 20, or actually let's go back to verse uh, 19. It says, For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption. Sounds very similar to the body, right? We have a body, these corruptible bodies. Well, all of creation has been in slavery to corruption. He says that the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. There again, an allusion to the resurrection. All of creation is in angst. It's subjected to corruption. Our car is corrupt. Our TV is corrupt. Everything that we touch falls into corruption. The same that we do. So we're tied to the creation in that way. We all are corruptible. But what we look forward to the day when our bodies will be redeemed and all of creation will be redeemed. In verse 24, but in hope, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. And so we purify ourselves, but we also eagerly wait for this transition that's, that's to take place. Well, and tied to uh, all of creation being affected in this way, we could turn now to 2 Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, we have uh, the new heavens and the new earth uh, reference there. But we don't want to just focus on the fact that there's new heaven and new earth. We want to focus on the practical side because that's where we're at in our lesson right now. Uh, we'll start in verse 11 of 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, Since all these things are to be destroyed, he just talked about how all the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, the earth and all its works be burned up. So he says, Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? So in, the, in lieu of the fact that all the earth will be destroyed, as it is right now, we ought to live in holy conduct and godliness. Knowing that that, that car, and I keep referencing cars, but uh, that car that we think is, is very fancy and that's what our whole life is about, it's going to be destroyed. Uh, the house that we value so much, one day is going to be destroyed. So what will last is when we live in holy conduct and godliness. That's what will last beyond the things of this world. But he goes on in verse 13, But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth, 
in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. So the fact that we anticipate these beautiful things that God's going to bring about, it ought to prompt within us a desire to be pure, as we saw in 1 John chapter 3, but also to be in peace, spotless and blameless, as we see here in 2 uh, Peter chapter 3. But further than that, it should also issue into a life of diligence and working for the kingdom. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the very one that we looked at in connection to uh, the contrast between the image of the earthy and that of the heavenly, he concludes this chapter about the resurrection in verse 58 like this. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. So the hope that we have in the future affects the way that we live today, both as we live in purity, but also as we live in productivity for the kingdom. So we want to live a life of purity, anticipating the fact that one day we'll be transformed into his image. And even today, we want to already begin to bear that image in purity and holiness and, and, and godly conduct. But then we also want to be busy about the work of Christ and building up the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, while we're here on the earth. And, and we know that when we do that, it won't be in vain because our works will go with us into eternity. And so we can look ahead to that. And so I think we'll conclude our lesson there. Uh, looking back, we see that in Genesis chapter 5, yes, Again, I want to reiterate that this passing down of the image, this could be a passing down of the image of God from Adam. Adam receives the image of God, and then he has a son in his image, which would uh, imply and indicate that the image of God is passed on. But let's also remember that we also had other things passed down to us from Adam as well, whether that's what's uh, specifically being mentioned here or not. And that is we have these corruptible, perishable, prone to sickness, prone to death bodies that we live in now. But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, we have the hope that just, just as sure, just as certain as we have been born the image of the earthy, we will bear the image of the heavenly. And that's our hope as Christians. And that's what we look forward to in the future. And that prompts us into a life of purity and also a life of productivity. So hopefully this has been helpful to everyone here uh, this afternoon. That concludes our study.